In this video we'll be replacing the dual core processor in this laptop with a quad core, which will take us on a small journey through hardware modding, overwriting the laptop's firmware and uh... This is often referred to as the quad core mod. Before we begin, this video is also available of Deutsch, Nihongo ni i Naruskim. The Quadco mod applies to laptops with the motherboard utilizing the socket pay, but where the manufacturer never intended for quad cores to be installed. This includes the Lenovo ThinkPad T500, the T400, but unfortunately not the legendary X200, because its CPU is soldered to the motherboard. But why do we even call it a mod? Isn't it just a simple CPU upgrade? There are socket P laptops which were designed and shipped in quad core configurations, like the ThinkPad W700 and the Dell M6400. There it is just in fact a simple CPU swap. But the vast majority of laptops in that generation were designed and shipped with dual or just single core CPUs. For those quite a bunch more has to be done. I'll be demonstrating what has to be done in the case of the T500. To perform this mod we need to modify the CPU, modify the motherboard, change the firmware and, optionally, upgrade the cooler. Which CPUs can be used and why on earth you would even want to do such a thing will be covered in the following chapter. So, shall we? The laptops of that generation represent the end of an era in hardware design. These laptops use... GM45, a chipset belonging to a family of chipsets codenamed Kentiga, which is one of Intel's last family of chipsets where the boot process was its own separate thing. This is important because these laptops are the last of their kind where something called the Intel Management Engine can be truly removed from the laptop's firmware. With the design of newer laptops, the Intel Management Engine became part of the boot process. Whilst it can mostly be stripped out with a tool called ME Cleaner, a part of it must remain. Why that matters and the true insanity of a rabbit hole that is the Intel Management Engine I'll cover in an upcoming video. For the motivation of all of this, just know that although spending money to upgrade a laptop released in 2008 doesn't make any financial sense, these laptops are important to a lot of people, including me. Socket Pay gives you three choices. The Q9000, the Q9100 and the QX9300. Although the online spec sheet tells you that there is no turbo boost, all CPUs boost by 266 MHz, when not more than two cores are used. This boosting feature is called Intel Dynamic Acceleration. It's the predecessor to Intel's Turbo Boost and is the reason why on the online spec sheet the CPUs are listed as having no Turbo Boost capability. As of the creation of this video, the QX9300 goes for 55 to 70 euro on eBay and AliExpress, with the Q9000 going for as low as 22 euro. That 45 watt TDP though, doesn't it kill the runtime on a battery? It definitely reduces it. It's twice the course after all. However, in the specific case of this family of laptops with Ultra Base, you can splurge on a secondary battery, which slides into where the CD drive usually goes. I caught myself a brand new Battery 43 for 110 euro. This not only reversed the on-time lost, but I actually got an extra hour of runtime out of it. To get started, we need to disassemble the laptop and to remove the motherboard. This will not be covered in this video, as there are many excellent disassembly guides online, with the ones on libreboot.org being linked in the description below. So, let's finally get to the modding itself. I have already disassembled the laptop, removed the cooler and cleaned off the thermal paste. Removing the CPU is the easy part. 
The socket is unlocked by twisting the screw counterclockwise and the CPU can be lifted up. Here is the old dual core and the new quad core right next to it. As you can see, the quad cores of that generation are essentially two glued together dual core dies. Ironically, this is what Intel accused AMD of doing with their epic CPU lineup in 2017. Even if true, I hope you can smell the hypocrisy right through the screen. But I digress. To continue, we need to insulate some of the CPU pins. Some of the written guides online suggest using small plastic tubing to cover the pins and to then drill into the socket to accommodate the larger pin diameter. I recommend not doing that, because the argument of the resale value really doesn't matter anymore and drilling into the fragile socket is a risky move to say the least. Instead, we'll be breaking the pins off. In total, five pins have to be removed. The removal concerns D8, AA7, AA8, AC8 and AE8. For reference, this picture is linked in the description below. Position the underside of the CPU so that the golden corner points northwest. Without exerting force on the pins, get a firm grip on the CPU. Find the first pin and double, triple and quadruple check that you actually have the correct one. Then start wiggling back and forth. Whilst I'm doing that wiggling, why are we even doing this? Quad cores arrived rather late to the Intel Core 2 series of CPUs. The quad cores on socket P brought new pin specifications which motherboard manufacturers did not implement for motherboard designs already deep into production. Luckily, these pin changers are small enough that they can be modded in. For instance, the pin I am removing right now, D08, is listed as reserved and must be left unconnected. Sooner or later the pin will give way and is removed in a very clean and orderly fashion. Repeat the same for the remaining four pins. Finally, look through the pins from each side of the CPU. This way you can catch pins that you accidentally bent out of shape and you can bend them back. If all pins are straight, we can move on to... Like with the CPU, the specs for the socket differ as well. Pin D22 is marked as reserved and remains unconnected on dual core designs. Whilst with a quad core, D22 requires the signal GTL ref. The TLDR on that is that this provides the reference voltage to insulate the CPU logic of the second die from electrical noise. This signal is created by a voltage divider right here in between a 1K and 2K ohm resistor. This pin, AD26, has to be connected to pin D22. D22 can be found by counting from any landmark you can identify in the vicinity. Here I tape down the wire for easier soldering. After a quick tap on each end, the connection is complete. The laptop's original firmware is not equipped to deal with a quad-core and will crash if all four cores are enabled. To be able to use the laptop with the new quad-core, we are required to disable multi-core support in the BIOS. This will enable just a single core on our CPU, which kinda defeats the purpose. So we need a replacement for the motherboard's firmware. Here we have two choices. The Coreboot project is an open source firmware replacement available for a big number of computers. Here we have to configure and to compile the firmware image from scratch. Another option is to get a pre-configured and pre-built firmware image from the Libreboot project, which is a distribution of Coreboot for a small number of computers closely following the free as in freedom concept of privacy and end user ownership. Just like Debian is a distribution of Linux, Libreboot is a distribution of Coreboot. Both for Coreboot and Libreboot you can choose between having Grub or CBIOS as your bootloader. If you are new to these projects, go with CBIOS, since this will provide a simple boot environment which we are used to from other computers. With Libreboot, the Intel management engine is automatically removed. If you choose Coreboot and want to remove the Intel management engine, you'll be generating a piece of the firmware called the Intel Flash Descriptor 
and inserting it into the firmware image that you are compiling. A step covered in the documentation on Libreboot.org. One thing to keep in mind if you choose one or the other is that whilst Libreboot saves you the hassle of compiling your firmware image, it does not include microcode updates for the CPU, as that conflicts with the free as in freedom philosophy. Quite a long story for another time. Going through the configuration of Coreboot is out of the scope of this video. The link to Coreboot's website, which has an excellent documentation, is in the description below. Going forward, I simply assume that your firmware image is ready. Before we perform the flashing of the firmware, there is one more thing we should do. The embedded controller, a microcontroller for small tasks like battery management, fan control logic and so on, has a firmware as well, which can only be upgraded if the original motherboard firmware is still present. The easy way to do this is to boot up Windows and to perform an update with Lenovo's BIOS update tool, though in my case this firmware's version was already up to date. The very first time flashing the motherboard's firmware cannot be done in software. It has to be done physically. This is easiest done with a chip clamp which connects to your EEPROM programmer, a Raspberry Pi in my case. This step, including which EEPROM programmers can be used, is covered in great detail on Libreboot.org and is, again, out of the scope of this video. The number one thing you should do is to perform the backup of your old firmware. Now we can finally write the firmware image to the EEPROM and this enables us to boot into an operating system with all four cores running. Mind you, there is a little more nuance to this than I'm letting on. For instance, with both Coreboot and Libreboot you do not have access to the typical BIOS menu anymore, and settings like disabling the power management beeps is done via a text file which is part of the firmware image. But in general, this really is all that has to be done to get the quad-core operational. Optionally, you can upgrade the CPU cooler as well. Depending on whether you have the ATI graphics version of the ThinkPad T500 or the version with just the Intel integrated graphics, you have two different coolers. The cooler for the T500 without the ATI graphics has one less heat pipe and more importantly the intake on the bottom side is blocked. Buying a fresh CPU cooler might be a good idea in general, since getting a used T500 usually gets you a CPU cooler that has lived through a lot already and might have an annoying rattle if you are really unlucky. Might as well buy the better cooler at that point. Simply putting in the better ATI graphics cooler into a non-ATI graphics laptop won't work, because a piece of the motherboard interferes. Here we have to dremel off a piece of the cooler. But don't worry, this does not concern a heat pipe, just a piece of the cooler. Now the better cooler will fit into the standard non-ATI graphics chassis and draw in air from below. Going all the way to the extreme, you can drill holes out the bottom of the chassis for a larger intake. After you drill the holes, you should cover them with a piece of mesh, like this fan mesh that I bought for cheapsies of Amazon. Don't forget to clean the old and dry thermal paste from the CPU cooler and apply new paste to the CPU. As for the integrated Intel graphics chip, if the thermal pad is still in mint condition, you can use just that. Otherwise, you have to replace it. But be careful when buying pads. It has to be 1mm in thickness. I bought this 0.5mm one and it prevented proper contact between the chip and the pad. As a result, putting even a slight load on the GPU, even just watching a video, thermally throttled the GPU, which the laptop cannot recover from until you perform a reboot and renders the laptop unusably laggy. It has to be a 1mm pad. With everything performed, assemble the laptop again. And... And here we are. Having done everything, we have a Lenovo ThinkPad T500 with a quad-core. Quite a hassle and a terrible financial decision. 
but without a doubt it is now a laptop with character. And with the absence of the Intel management engine, a laptop which is a teeny tiny bit closer to the free as in freedom concept of privacy and end user ownership. Quite a deep philosophical topic in its own right, which I'll cover in an upcoming video. If you have any questions, the best place for getting answers regarding like any of this are the Coreboot and Libreboot channels on the IRC server Libera. Links in the description below. As for the series, tune in next time to see on how we can connect a modern graphics card to these two poor ancient old thinkpads. I'm serious. See ya!